Did you film yesterday? Yes, I did. Cool. <laughs> Are we good? All right. So before we get started, so they had the caucuses yesterday. Who won the Republican caucus? And I, I, I predicted that. I did actually, but it wasn't that big of a prediction. Yeah, Cruz won. Who got second? And my guess is Trump doesn't like, you know, whenever he loses, he quits. So I could see him something happening, like a uh, grandson sick or something, and he'll be he pulling was really out. Close, so it was like, <laughs> and who was third? So it's probably between those three now for the Republican. For the Democratic, uh, they were close. It was like almost tied. They don't actually count votes if people go to the caucus. What they do is they count number of people who will go to the state convention. Three. That's how they count. So each little caucus picks a certain number of people who go to the state convention. What are their, uh, I think, sixteen hundred total, and Clinton won by four. Yeah. As of right now, she won by four out of the sixteen hundred, and in some of the caucuses they had they had ties, and so they couldn't you know which one what the delegate would be either Clinton or Sanders. So they flipped a coin, six of them, right? Clinton's people won all six. Oh, that's great. <laughs> all six. If it just would have been 50 50, Sanders would have won. Wait, so what happened? Those six people. Didn't... No, there were six at the caucuses. There was a tie between Clinton supporters and Sanders supporters. So they flipped a coin to see who would get the, the delegate. And all six of the coin flips went to. I know each individual coin flip is unique. Why, why if it was 50 50? Well, because then it would have been 3 3. And if, if Clinton would have lost 3 and Sanders would have gained 3. Mm -hmm. And since he'll make it 4, they'd be saying narrow victory for, for I was Clinton. You were adding that many. I see what you mean, yeah. Adding 3 to each. Yeah. Yeah. And so that shows you how close it was. I was. And you know, so I listen to the radio and it was saying that Clinton won. Narrow margin, but she won. Well, if it's that close, that, that is in reality a tie. Who was the third Democratic person? Like, it was yeah, he's, he was the former governor of Maryland, and he literally, he like knew he, or something. he dropped out of the race during the voting of the caucuses. He literally announced that he's going to not, he's ending his campaign. That's so sad. <laughs> but he knew he wasn't going to win. I think he, was kind of hoping he'd do well enough to maybe at the convention become vice president. I think that was his plan, but he just said, oh, I'm so low, I can't get enough money to keep the campaign going. So, it's going to be, I don't know, who knows? Clinton still has a bad chance, but it's going to be very close. And the Republicans, if I, if I was gambling, I'd say Richard Nixon. All right, so, let's go ahead and... He's tan, fit, and rested, and ready to go. Yeah, he's very well rested. He's been dead for 23 years, and that's perfect. Who? He fit right in. He fit right in. All right. So I think well, I'll give you the little list of turns probably tomorrow or, or Thursday, but we will have a test. There is a reading assignment. I did assign this, but I don't know if I said it yesterday or not. Did I not? 7.32 to 9.50. And, but go ahead. I, I was originally going to put it for Wednesday. Let's make it for Thursday. And I will assign tomorrow 9.50 to 9.77. So basically we're going to finish the chapter on the progressive. Next week, probably Tuesday, we'll have a test. I want to get the test done so we can get, then we'll get to World War One, 20s, Great Depression, and then done. Then we'll just say, okay, Great Depression. Obama was like the president. Good luck. <laughs> Let's give a few years. You're pointing my drawers. What? Oh yeah, that's that's a. Uh... All right, so we got right to the ancillary cases. A student of mine a few years ago, Matt Podolinsky, made this creepy Calhoun head. Yeah. Why? And. Because he, he's a very talented artist and he did something to do. 
I just stuck it up. Someone gave me someone gave me a pickle back because I had the, the yodeling pickle. So naturally. Alright, so did we get to this yesterday? No. So the parrot, the Treaty of Paris was signed. Peace! Peace. Hmm? Wait a second. Now, is there something a little out of place with the uh, peace treaty ratified? Sports. <laughs> Awful slaughter, I really normally don't associate with peace. Our troops at Manila killed the Filipinos in the thousands, 40 Americans killed. Almost immediately, once the Filipinos realized we weren't there to liberate them, would begin one of the darker times in American history called the Filipino Insurrection. And the Filipino Insurrection would go from 1898 to essentially 1903. And you notice one of the great quirks of the English language, the Philippines is a PH, Filipino, F. Why? Why not? The Filipino Insurrection. Yeah, that's true. It is an F-I. Yeah. Makes no sense, does it? And this actually happened at a number of places, even though it was highly censored. These are Filipino uh, civilians who were executed by American soldiers. And they were executed, we don't know how many, hundreds, hundred thousands, in this horrific fight, usually for reprisals for guerrilla raids. Yeah. So did, what, what like, triggered it? What did they do? Did they just do that thing? Remember, the Filipinos wanted independence. So did they, like, revolt? Or? Yeah, basically, they're fighting against the United States when the United States made it clear, we're going to keep you as a colony. Yep. Now, an American colony. And... Oops, let's go back here. Emilio Apanado was the leader of the, of the Filipino uprising. And much like against the Spanish, he had to use the same kind of guerrilla tactics. We talked about this before, and how awful it was. And you can imagine how much even more difficult it was because the average Filipino spoke Spanish and and Filipino, Filipino, but Spanish, and the American soldiers spoke English. And so that combined with already being in the jungle, strange atmosphere, people looked different to each other, made it that much more stressful. And this is an anti-war cartoon. It's kind of hard to see, but it's one of my favorite cartoons of the war. It's it really actually does something that's a pretty horrible, almost graphic image in a very comical way. I don't know if you've ever seen a game like this. It used to be a fair game, or not like a county's fair, where there'd be a tent or just a sheet with a hole in it. And somebody would like stick their face in it and you try to throw like tomatoes at it. It was an awful game. It was almost always a black man in a white or a white county fair. That's almost always what it was. But this is mocking this. So what is it where you hit um, Rack a mole, yeah. It's kind of like that. And the idea was they're trying to hit Aguinaldo, but they can't hit him. That's Uncle Sam trying to hit him. And he's being cheered on by that's McKinley. You can barely read it here. That's Ham. And what's his? It's not tomatoes. What's he throwing? And so American soldiers are dying. Yeah, like the horse right there. Trying to get Aguinaldo. Whack a mole or you know, Ham. Couple things about this. McKinley tried to justify this. In fact, he did it right after the, the United States declared war and trying to justify why the United States must do this. And according to him, he said he, was, he could not sleep in the White House. Not sleep. Woke or got up, went to his knees and prayed. And a vision came to him that we must annex the Philippines to bring Christianity to the Philippines. And that was our duty, yeah. Who was that? McKinley did this. So McKinley said that. Now how do we justify this? I, we will bring Christianity to the Philippines. That kind of fits in with that. Civilization. Now, I don't believe yeah, that this really happened. I don't believe that's what he had this vision. For one very important reason. The Spanish have been colonizing the Philippines since the 16th century. What religion are the Spanish? Hmm? And what do you think they're going to do? Just like they did in the Americas. You're all, over 90% of the population of the Philippines were Catholic. 
because the Spanish made them count. So basically, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm almost positive Catholics are Christians. So basically what he's saying is, we're going to bring Christianity to the Christians. Now that doesn't really sound like something that actually happened. Uh, there's a small percentage of Muslims there too. But, what does that say? Now maybe McKinley didn't know. Almost certainly this was he, someone told him to say this. Or he said, I got this great idea. But when a politician, somebody in charge, says that, says something like that that is, without a doubt, false, garbage. They're Christian already. That's not the reason you're invading. Why are you lying? Why would McKinley, or at least his handlers, want him to say something that is clearly a lie? What does that say about their opinion of Americans, American citizens? They don't know anything. So you can fool them. You can tell them something and they'll buy it. Has everyone got that? That's actually a really important element. And then about two. If you have someone, if someone's in a little bit of authority and they have low expectations for you, what do people usually meet them? Oh yeah. Because low expectations are really easy to meet. And so basically it's saying you're stupid, let's keep the dialogue stupid, oh, we're all stupid together. And it's a very common trick. The idea is, I know you guys don't know. And if somebody says, no, wait a second, they're already Christian. Ah, oh, you're just against America. And that would be a very common way of doing it. But let's get back to this. Well, actually, there's a couple ways. Yeah, it's kind of making them... It seems subvert, subservient to, to Hannah, so to a man. But also, little boys and girls would, their toddler outfits would be dresses. That was very, very common. You could pass them down to both, you, you know, more expensive and easy for the diaper and things. I'm, I'm scared of little children. I don't know. Have you seen them? They're all small with little hands that come at you. I'm scared. Yeah. Is there a reason why they're flying backwards? Oh, the American flag. Yeah. That I, I don't, I, it just put up there, so it's not necessarily. If it was upside down, that would mean something's wrong, but that is not. So, these are American soldiers. Eventually, they would go to khaki uniforms for obvious reasons cooler, a little better camouflage. The modern smokeless part of powder by the the end of the deck or the end of the century, the rifles had a range of a mile. I'm not saying you hit something a mile away, but no longer could you have a nice, brightly colored uniform or even a uniform that didn't blend in. So more and more going to khaki. This picture pixelated more than I thought it would, but it's showing Filipino insurrectionists, and they're trying to kick the Americans out. And most of them have either spears or they're carrying machetes. They didn't have weapons. And the thing about this type of guerrilla war, there's no prisoners. The guerrillas can't take prisoners. And almost always what would happen is there'd be a quick guerrilla attack. And think about machetes, guys coming out of the jungle with machetes. Attack a few, uh, a column of American soldiers, what would they leave? Heads. Huh? Heads. Yeah, and hacked up bodies. And if you saw your friend like that, what would you want? Leave. Huh? Leave. <laughs> Maybe you might want to leave eventually. But what might you want at that moment? They killed my friends, what? Revenge, so they're not going to take prisoners. And these type of wars escalate. I mean, they're really horrible. Guerrilla wars are worse. Just because a combination of that and the stress involved. Here is an example of that. A little village called Penyang. A General, a General Smith ordered Marines as, it, as a reprisal for a guerrilla attack on American forces to kill everybody over 10. They lined up every civilian they could and shot them and dropped them in a, in a little dive right there, or a little uh, a canal right there. And this is it. Kill one out over, everyone over 10. This would come out against the war, but most of this information was censored. And I like this picture too, to show you what it's like. Here they're interrogating two Filipino women. And the thing is, you know, they're clearly terrified. You can imagine the language issue, cultural issue, the way people look, it's gonna make such a big difference. But not only that, I guarantee the American soldiers are terrified too. Because if there's guerrilla attack, 
and anybody potentially could be a gorilla. Now, we've talked about this before. Anyone could be a gorilla. When are you safe? Never. Your mind can never relax. And that is why these types of wars have such a strain on the soldiers. And that is why, well, World War I, they gave it a name. They called it shell shock. World War II, and through Vietnam, the Americans, Korea, Vietnam, they called it battle fatigue. What do we call it today? Yeah, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's because eventually, your mind mutants. That's what they called in World War I. They called it your mind mutants. It's had enough. You just can't take it. Because it's continuous stress. And so the thing about it is, is that's why atrocities like this happen on both sides. They just snap. They can't do it anymore. And not to excuse the people who commit the atrocities, but remember, somebody ordered them there. Somebody ordered them to do this. And that is why these type of wars are something, first off, you don't want to get involved. And second off, that's what happens when you get an empire. When you get an empire, you fight wars like that. That means you got to justify putting your young men and now young men and women, then it was all young men, and fighting like this. I'll show you one more example of this, but very quickly, we got to find the rebels. The most common way of interrogation was called the water torture. Lay someone down, someone put a piece of cloth over their face, and that's not. That's an American. That's actually a Filipino doing it. That's a Filipino gorilla. Or at least someone suspected it. You dump water over their face, it simulates drowning. Sometimes they can die from it, almost always from a heart attack. Because I guess it, it, it's just it's just the pain. It's unreal. And this is not one of the many ways to try to find other tortures to be used. Once again, I want to be the good guys, and my country to be the good guys, but these type of wars lead to desperate maneuvers like this. In World War II, the United States, well, the, the Allies, would execute over 120 Japanese soldiers for doing this to Allied prisoners of war. The same torture. But in the 1970s, Israel was having trouble with terrorist attacks from a group called the Palestinian Liberation Organization, a tried couple rooting them out. And so they started using this torture. But the problem is water torture, torture sounds bad. And so they changed the name. Boarding. Yeah, boarding. Because you literally you're on a board and you time down and you tilt their head down a little bit. And so the water, you have to feel when water goes up your nose, but it's more intense, kind of gets into your sinuses, which not only hurts, but it's also terrifying. That's why it's called waterborne. It starts here. How do we tie this? Make a kind of a little closed circle. Insular cases? What did the insular case have to do with what happened in Afghanistan in 2001? So where do they put the prisoners from? Afghanistan, what's the name of the base? Guantanamo. Guantanamo Bay, because of the insular cases, and they didn't have the constitutional rights. So the thought was, well, we can use methods of interrogation. Since they weren't getting the information, it turned out almost all of them had nothing to do with terrorists who were there. That eventually they started waterboarding, which is the water torture, which ironically we executed Japanese for. It's kind of interesting, the circle kind of comes all the way around. One guy, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is the one of the main planners of the September 11th attack, he was waterboarded over 120 times. He already told everything that happened, but they're trying to force him to admit something that wasn't true, and he wouldn't do it. He want, he, they want, we wanted him to admit, the CIA wanted him to admit, that Iraq was involved in the September 11th attack. He hated Iraq, hated Saddam Hussein, he was a mortal enemy and would not do it. We wanted a justification for the war. So that's what happened with him. But it's all these things relate. By the way, that's a very elaborate version of synthesis. But everything does connect. And it's amazing how it just kind of happens again and again and again. You can see it over and over again. All right, so also the, most of the information for this was censored. The United States kept firm control over the media. So this information did not get back to the United States. Remember what I told you. When you have empire, you do things. One of them. You deprive rights because you got to hold on to the empire. So they started to ban freedom of the press and freedom of the speech. Happens every time. It's no coincidence that once you start having an empire, you start having spy agencies and governments having secrets. Happen here. It doesn't mean these are necessarily good or bad things. 
but it always happens. And that's what happened until a lot of Americans did not know, except little tidbits, even though by 1902, most Americans were totally and completely opposed to the war, to this. By then it's like, we've had enough. It was great in 1900, but we won this great victory. Now it's awful, a terrible thing. And this should remind you of something going back to before the Civil War. Remember, why did Southerners want to censor the press, specifically abolitionist newspapers? Because what did they fear? And that's exactly what's going on here. Or that Americans will say, stop the war and get out of it. That's why almost immediately during the Vietnam War, even though most of the press was, was pretty pro-war, but the war itself, because they reported a lot of it, because it was so awful in Vietnam, was anti-war. So let's get through a couple of these things and get to the price. The realization is now, I meant, when the war was finally over, I kind of went out of order here. I don't know how I even did this. Aguinaldo was captured. It's more complex than you simply capture. Basically, Teddy Roosevelt, made a new governor general of the Philippines, William Howard Taft, who finally came up with a kind of an agreement with Aguinaldo. Basically, the United States will allow the Philippines for some self-government, and they promised them their independence on July 4th, 1947. Basically, the United States was acknowledging, we can't, we don't want this. We're not gonna give you your independence right away, but you're essentially gonna have some self-government, kind of like a protectorate. So they have their own government, they even have their own army, but the United States will have overall control. Yeah. So what are the numbers? Okay, the numbers. U.S. battle deaths. The number of soldiers that die in battle were over 5,000. We don't have the exact numbers on this one because of how many died of disease, but over 5,000 Americans died in battle. Filipino insurrection is over 20,000. What, what was the biggest killer in the Spanish-American War? Yellow fever. What was it? Yellow yeah, yellow fever disease. What's the other one? Yeah, food poisoning. Here, look how many more died in this fight. And this is not. This is a pretty common thing. In Iraq in 2003, almost no American, very few American casualties to conquer Iraq. But over 4,000 and probably over 50,000, over 4,000 killed, over 50,000 wounded in the insurrection and revolution that followed. So it's kind of like this. But look how many Filipino civilians. I've seen estimates as high as 500,000. That seems too high. 100,000 seems too low. I mean, we're just talking. It, the civilian casualties have to be just outrageously high. And that's not counting all the people forced out of their homes, uh, people wounded, families disrupted. This was an awful thing. The Filipinos have a very interesting relationship with the United States. After they won their independence, the U.S. basically stayed there, and kept military bases there. And in the 1980s, the Filipinos kept Americans out. So there's no more American bases there. They're still, we're not enemies per se, but there's a, a little bit of a tense relationship. And the Philippines, that was an American colony still, even though they had a little bit of self-government. That was the Japanese target in 1941. The Japanese did not want the Philippines sitting there blocking their trade. So that's why they attacked the nearest American naval base, kind of the hoping just to keep the Americans out of there. And that was in the colony of the White Islands. We'll come back to this, but it was the Philippines. Which the Japanese would conquer and the US would reconquer? I don't know what the best way to say it, 45. We'll get back to that when we get to World War II. But while this is going on, there's an election in 1900. The country's still pretty euphoric. We won this great election, or not win this great war. It's going to be, for the most part, a rematch of 1896, Brian and McKinley. So here's a McKinley poster, and it's trying to show how great things are now. 1896, when there's a Democratic president, 1900, when they're after four years of McKinley. So this shows depression under a Democratic president because of the panic of 1893, booming economy. Look at the small stats. Factories are booming. Run on the banks, banks doing well. Spanish rule in Cuba, a prison cell. Span American rule, a school. And if you can't read it, because it's kind of fuzzy, but it says the American flag 
has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, more territory, but for humanity's sake. Basically saying this was a civilizing effort. But you also might notice something else. Who's the new vice presidential nominee? Teddy Roosevelt. Gotta get this now. Teddy Roosevelt was his vice presidential nominee. Actually, obviously, this is Hannah. Hannah chose Roosevelt. Because what Roosevelt did was pretty remarkable politically. What was he, a building commissioner in, in New York City, undersecretary of the Navy, then the Rough Riders. Yeah. Wait, so who's, who's running for president? McKinley. So McKinley and then who? And then McKinley against Bryant. So it's a rematch of 1896. Okay, and Teddy Roosevelt was going for vice president. Yeah, he's going to be McKinley's vice president. He's going to be McKinley's vice president. Okay. So McKinley won. We're getting there. Okay. But yes. Now Roosevelt's going to be his vice presidential nominee because riding the fame of the Rough Riders, so like right like that, he became the governor of New York. And this is what we got to get. Roosevelt was sympathetic to a new movement. Roosevelt was close to the progressives. And the progressives wanted to regulate capitalism, a little bit like the populists. They were more using the term more liberal. Hannah was laissez-faire. He didn't want Roosevelt in the richest state with the most banks and the most industry. What a great way to get rid of him. Think of vice presidents. Vice presidents back then, it was like a political graveyard. Once they were vice president, they were basically done. Not only that, Roosevelt, then as vice president, would only have two constitutional duties. Do you remember what those are? Um, break ties. Yeah, break ties in the Senate. What's the other one? Yeah, wait for the president to die. An omen. That's all the vice president does. So Hannah thought, I'll get rid of him, put my own person as governor. Roosevelt would be the youngest man ever elected vice president. And so he, he's very ambitious. He jumped at the chance to get his name in the spotlight. And he's right. Roosevelt jumped at the chance. Yeah. So what, what was he? What Remember, he was, the, he was the political boss where he controlled the Republican Party in Ohio. Yeah. And by 1900, he pretty much he had, he pulled the strings for the Republican Party nationwide, the National Party. Okay. So, but didn't he have, like, different business? He, he had business... He had business ties with a couple different companies as a lawyer, but for the most part, he just he just ran there. Yeah, he he's the one who marked, um, the money from the big business flowed through him. Uh, so, uh, okay, never mind. Yeah. He wanted to regulate, regulate, a little bit like the populist. We'll talk more about that when we get to the progressives. Oh, you know, I never even noticed that, but it does. It's like, um, like an angel, or like an angel, or maybe Lady yeah, Columbia, because it's got the little hat right there. I mean, maybe. Oh, yeah, well, that's what's represent liberty. But like the, the box thing inside the reef? That's a hat. I'm just yeah. <laughs> I know it's not right. I know it actually, it's supposed to be like a stocking cap. So like the word. It's something like what the sans culottes wore in the French Revolution. A couple of us who remember that. Yeah. So why didn't you want Roosevelt to be the governor? Because he might want to regulate business. Okay. Which is him. Hannah wanted to just leave us alone. Boss, I said this. Oh, okay. So, William Jennings Bryan was a nominee, and this is where Bryan would make a fatal mistake. Bryan was totally opposed to imperialism. But he wanted it away. He just wanted to get this issue over. There was a battle to ratify the Treaty of Paris. To ratify the Treaty of Paris required two-thirds of a vote. Brian did not want to annex the Philippines, but he decided to drop his opposition to the treaty. Brian dropped his opposition to the ratification of the Treaty of Paris. So it passed. Now he's thinking, 
It's a done deal. We'll worry about it when I'm president. But it made Brian look like a hypocrite. And Brian, who already lost in 1896, could not afford that. Because Brian dropped his opposition. That would help a pretty big victory for President McKinley. Even more than 1896. Yeah, Brian made a calculated error. Brian's going to run again against William Howard Taft in 1908, and each time he get worse. Yeah. What did Trump his opposition to? To the, to the Treaty of Paris. Okay. He was opposed to it because he didn't, he didn't want an empire. He didn't want, a, he didn't want especially the Philippines. But he thought, oh, we'll just kind of let it go. We'll, we'll worry. The treaty's a done deal, and then I will, everybody will, everybody will believe I'm anti-imperialist. Didn't work. And so, what happened to McKinley? Almost immediately, the assassination of McKinley. All, I mean, just a few months after the, his second inauguration, he was in Buffalo, New York, and Leon Shawgosh, an anarchist, with a pistol wrapped inside of a handkerchief, was able to get just a few feet away and shot President McKinley before anybody could react. Now, after Garfield's assassination, there were some presidential guards they took from a police organization that was created to stop counterfeiting. Did I tell you that one? During the Civil War, they wanted to stop counterfeiting, so they created this police force to infiltrate counterfeiters. You might have heard of them called the Secret Service. The Secret Service was to stop counterfeiters. Then they figured, well, you can also guard the president. They really know what they're doing. There, there are a couple of Secret Service agents just out of there. The yeah, Secret Service today guards government officials. Stops counterfeiters. And President McKinley was assassinated. I love this picture too. I like this guy just kind of going, hey, don't forget me, but him. Look at him, look at him. What does he look like he's doing? He looked like he's using McKinley as a shield. Well, he looks like Oh, shoot him, not me. Which I'm almost positive is the exact opposite of what a Secret Service agent is supposed to do. They really weren't trained at all. This was part of a wave of uh, anarchist attacks all over the, the country, over the world. And Zolgos assumed this will lead to an anarchist revolution. So he's an anarchist. He's an anarchist. He's an immigrant from Eastern Europe. Bulgaria. I think it's Zolgos. Well, this is going to begin a nativist wave. Do you remember what nativism is? Nativism is what? Anti what? So, nativist wave against immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe that have strange sounding names to English speakers. They must be, actually, that was a big element of it, though. They must be somehow alien and they're radical, bent on assassination. And so it's going to begin this big movement against immigrants that weren't from, or immigrants that were from any place other than Northern or Western Europe. After World War I, it will explode into a red scare, an anti-communist scare, but it really starts with Shawgans. Very nativist, fear of race mixing. There he is in his, uh, his mugshot. He was, he was executed a month after the assassination. There he is in prison where after it happened. And they kind of roughed him up when they arrested him, you can tell. The revolution did not happen. And now, in the immortal words of Marcus Hanna, that damn cowboy is in the White House. President Roosevelt would become the youngest man ever to become president. He's not the youngest man elected. Remember, he was elected vice president, not president. When he went in, on his own in 1904, He'd already be about 43. So who was the youngest man ever elected president? Hmm? Brian never was elected. He was nominated, but never elected. Who? No, Harris Harrison was actually the oldest. Have we already talked about him? No. Kennedy. Yeah. 
John can't deal with Yoke. What's he on this? 41. And so, his foreign policy, we'll get to his domestic stuff because it's a big deal, was called big stick diplomacy. He used to say this a term that everyone says is West African. I don't know if it is or not. I don't know if it could be. Speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. And on the surface, what it basically means is the speak softly part, we will try to get what America wants. The president, which speaks for the American foreign policy wise, through diplomacy. And if diplomacy doesn't work, then what do we use? And the big stick, the Navy and the Marines. There's another name for big stick diplomacy. It's a little bit more realistic when it comes right down to it. It's gunboat diplomacy. We, the US is big, bigger than you. We got more guns, do what we want. Now the US Army itself is tiny. But the U.S. did have a strong Navy, especially compared to little tiny countries like, well, the Dominican Republic. And there's something else you might notice from this cartoon, something that few people realize. You look at President Roosevelt as he goes through the Caribbean, which he saw as his private little swimming pool. What about him? No, yeah, yeah, kind of about you. He's huge. He's a giant, right? And not only that, look at those birds. They could scoop up an island in their beak. Thank goodness Roosevelt was there to protect them. Big stick diplomacy in reality is economic imperialism. Now remember, imperialism was empire for profit. Well, colonial empire, as it turned out, is really hard, as shown by the Filipino insurrection. So economic imperialism is control their economy. The countries will still be independent, but the United States will try to get economic control. Now, what does economic control mean? What it means is this. This is what we have to get. It's not, economic control means the U.S. will make sure that American business interests, American businesses and corporations, that they will be allowed to essentially take over whatever market they want. American business interests will really take over markets in these countries. So for example, United Fruit Company can take over the bananas and the sugar. Or same with oil companies, timber companies, that sort of thing. Yeah. So so the like the East India trading company. Yeah, it's actually a lot like that. With East India Company, you know, they didn't necessarily take over, but they dominated. Yeah. Really good analogy, because India wasn't really a British colony for a long time. The company owned it. To the, to the middle of the 18th, 19th century. And so that's the big deal about Cuba, why the U.S. would intervene. You mess around with the sugar planters, we send in the Marines. And that is economic imperialism. And so the U.S. is going to intervene all over Latin America. It's still the basic American foreign policy today. And you look at these times, these are all the different direct military interventions but most of the time, for example, what happened on Guatemala, we just sail a small fleet off Guatemala City and say, you do what we want. And I said, okay. Because we've invaded Nicaragua. Or we in heck, engineered a revolution in Panama. Look how many times we invaded Cuba. Dominican Republic, actually a number of times. It's not mentioned the one in 1904. But that's just up to the 1920s. So it's not just invasion, it's the threat. Other countries realize that we don't do what, we, what they want, they will invade. And this is going to breed a lot of resentment in Latin America. A lot of resentment that exists to this day. The U.S. will do the same things as it gets bigger and more powerful all the way around the world. Empire. Well, the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine would be Roosevelt's justification. So you've got to get the Roosevelt corollary down. That's 1904. And then that's an excerpt from the statement that Roosevelt made about the Republic of Santo Domingo, or as we call it today, the Dominican Republic. And basically what it is, just to review, before you start reading that, the Monroe Doctrine from 1824 said no European colonies 
No more European colonies in the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt, corollary means he added to that idea. So go ahead and read it now. What is it basically saying that the United States can do? Dominate the Western. How? Does so anyone want to finish reading these? Oh, I just noticed something. Is that a period? I must have hit enter or something. <laughs> so what is it saying America can do? It, United States going to other countries. Why? It doesn't, you know, it's okay. Intervention by some civilized nation. We're civilized, they're not civilized, but what's got to happen? Force the United States, however reluctantly, fragrant, fragrant. <laughs> cases of wrongdoing. The countries do something wrong. U.S. will come in. And who decides what wrongdoing is? Specifically, the president. So has everyone got that? What the United States is saying, we can intervene whenever we want. And let's be clear about it. Roosevelt didn't take this to a vote to all the countries of Latin America. Hey, we've got a great idea for you. No. He's announcing it. The United States is going to act as an international police power. And we will decide when and where. Not you. We will. And it all the big start was 1904. I didn't write this down. I didn't put it down, so you got to put it down. 1904 in the Dominican Republic. Then it was Santo Domingo, but everyone calls it the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic went default on their loans. They had been loaning or they had been borrowing money from Europe, mostly European banks. European banks loan them money knowing that they can get good interest rates. If you remember bonds, that's how governments loan money. So I'm going to write down the Dominican Republic with default of their laws. Now, the European banks want their money back. Now, you could say in business, especially laws on fair, you make a bad business decision like loan money to somebody who can't pay it back, that's your fault, right? No, the banks don't see it that way. They went to their governments and said, get us our money. And that's what happened. France and Germany sent warships to off the coast of the Dominican Republic to demand their money. Actually, we're going to send it. And that's why Roosevelt issued this. So has everyone got that? Europeans were going to send it, and Roosevelt said, no, we will send our fleet, not you, to get that money back. To force the Dominican Republic basically to squeeze every penny they can to pay back their loans. And that's what happened. That's where the Roosevelt corollary comes from. We don't want Europeans doing it. We'll do it and get that money back. And even though France was really upset about this, Germany was upset. They also realized, wow, the banks were, yes. Because now we can make risky loans to people and charge really high interest rates. If you don't pay it back, here come the Marines. So the United States took over Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, wrote them a new constitution. And in that constitution, it said, this is actually a remarkable thing that they forced the Dominican Republic to do. 50% of all their tax revenues must go to pay back their debt. Now, the Dominican Republic already has a lot of their the big thing is, is uh, sugar and banana. Sugar is the big one. It's already owned by foreign companies. And that means any tax revenue, half of it will go to foreign banks. That means there's significantly less money for crazy things like schools, or sewage, you know, uh, sewer facilities, police, roads, you name it. It's going overseas. That's the kind of thing the United States did. When the Dominican Republic tried to change the Constitution, the U.S. invaded again in 1916 to make sure that Constitution remained. 
And then people wonder why these countries are so poor. Now, the policy was they should have paid back their debts. But then again, this is going to encourage even more debt, isn't it? Think about it. Every bank now is going to say, or everybody's going to say, I'm going to buy bonds from these countries. Demand high interest rates. Because I know if they can't pay it back, here come the Marines. And this is going to happen time after time after time. Time, I'm not kidding. After time after time. Here's a great picture of Marines in Nicaragua. This is 1924. And Marines, what kind of flag? Who do you think gave them that flag? Pirates. That was their own joke about themselves. That's their dark humor. Because they know exactly what they're doing. They went into Nicaragua because they knew we're taking over the government to make sure the money flows north. We're nothing better than pirates. That's what we call a dark joke by the Marines. Which also tells you that pretty bright. So who do they do it for? Big step. First off, what kind of government they want? More and more in the 20th century, the United States said it was for democracy. But do we want democracy? Because democracy might lead to a change in those policies of economic imperialism. And so it was usually, we did big stick for banks, oil and timber, but there's one company we need to know. It became, it just was the fruit company, United Fruit. United Fruit would dominate most of the isthmus of, of Central America. They were the banana company. And bananas became the craze because more and more bananas became shipped. They last a long time. They just had a banana for lunch. Actually, it was from United Fruit. They don't call themselves United Fruit in America. They call themselves Chiquita. And they would soon have so much power that they would have a banana-shaped satellite that just simply orbits the Earth looking for banana-related crimes. Have you ever heard of something called the Banana Republic? These countries are called Banana Republics. And a lot of people think they're called Banana Republics because they grow bananas there. No, they're called Banana Republics because the banana company controls the country. They call the United Fruit the octopus because its tentacles were in every part of their life. They control the good land, they control the planters, they control the government, they control everything. United Fruit. That became the scourge of Latin America to, to people who wanted a democracy there, but a lot of money was made to stockholders back in the U.S. United Fruit, we will come back to United Fruit. Yeah? So what do we say for democracy banks? Basically, the United States did not want democracy in Latin America. Because if democracy, if the people start voting, they will vote for laws. Oh, this that, is for Latin America. Yeah, this is for Latin America. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, we don't want, we, we, we talk about democracy, we don't want, because people might vote for things like to keep the banana money in their own country. Oil and timber were other things the U.S. would vote for. Make sure that oil companies are timber companies. Yeah, in Latin America. They would get the concessions. But the big one was United Fruit. We'll come back to this in Guatemala. It became a really big deal in 1954. Now I gotta hit stop. Oh my goodness. We're watching Plan 9 from Outer Space.